video. Okay, do you know what next week is? Father's Day. Oh my gosh, okay, so what do you love to do with your dad? Camping. Why do you like to camp? Because, like, it's fun because there's, like, a pool everywhere. You like to swim in pools? Yeah. Okay, do you know what next week is? Father's Day. Oh my gosh, okay, so what do you love to do with your dad? Camping. Why do you like to camp? Because, like, it's fun because there's, like, a pool everywhere. You like to swim in pools? Yeah. We swing. My daddy pushes me. We go on the slides. And one day we went to a high one where, and then we went, and I went on the blue, yellow and blue slides. One of my favorite memories with my dad was when we were making food and then we got on the couch to watch a movie and we watched King Kong and we also got to eat one of my favorite foods. My favorite memory with dad is when we went fishing and at first he beat me with two fish and then we went back after it started raining and I beat him with five. <laughs> my favorite childhood memory of my dad would definitely be growing up, we'd have this blue lazy chair, rocking chair, and um, every single night when I was little, he would do my hair, he would um, he would braid my hair, he would comb it, put it in a ponytail, sitting on his lap. My mom didn't know how to do hair, so not her expertise, but my dad would always do my hair. And um, every night we'd sit on the rocking chair, he'd put my hair up real nice before bed, and he'd read me a story. And I remember I would fall asleep every single night on the rocking chair on his lap, and I was about Maybe up until I was like seven years old, every single night was our little ritual. We would um, sit on the rocking chair, he'd do my hair, and he'd read me a bedtime story, and I'd fall asleep on the rocking chair, and he'd pick me up, put me back to bed every single night. One of my favorite things to do with my dad is probably play football in the backyard, because it's really fun to throw and catch the ball and spend time with my dad. When I was a kid, my dad and I uh, would play Lego Batman together and in turn that turned me into a gamer and we'd always play stuff together like that and I'm still a gamer to this day. I didn't have a dad until recently but he changed my life in a good way. He made memories and like family time a lot more easy to be around and actually made me enjoy hanging out with my family. He changed the way that I perceive family in a good way and made life at home a lot easier. My favorite movie to watch with my dad is Endgame because I, because it's more. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite thing about my dad is probably his humor. Like, whenever we're all talking and he doesn't understand our child humor, he just kind of lifts up his shirt and just stares at us. <laughs> <laughs> that is what he does. <laughs> good, uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can bring the lights on. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you. Wow. So, dads, I guess maybe you don't realize you do have quite an impact. Um, I think that's one of the challenges of fathers is being able to dialogue, to hear things like that. And so, if you know, I, I learned a little bit about some of you dads that I, I'm not going to promise I might tease you a little bit about. But uh, that was really that was really cute. Um, please join me now as we go to prayer before we hear this message today. Lord, I thank you as you are indicating once again to us that you're the dad of all dads. And we thank you, Lord. And, and all of us, there's certain pain with, with us when we associate this sometimes with fathers. There's other great memories with it. But regardless of what's happened with our earthly fathers, you are our eternal spiritual father. And we thank you because you're a good, good father. And so we thank you, Lord, as people are prepared to hear this message today about what it is to be the model father. And, and I come to you, Lord, that you'll show people wherever they're at 
that they'll be able to receive you in a more deeper way than they ever have. We thank you, Lord, in your son Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So the title today is Model Father. And so I did a little research on a couple of things. So I found out in 1972, President Richard Nixon signed a bill into law honoring this day, Father's Day, the third Sunday in June. And so I, I did a little more research because I was curious, well, what, when did Mother's Day? Well, that was 58 years earlier, President Woodrow Wilson signed a bill into law make, that said the second Sunday of May will be a day that we recognize, recognize mothers. And although these two days are not part of like the liturgical calendar or God's calendar, I do think it's great that we recognize this. And it made me think about the Ten Commandments. Now, the first four of the Ten Commandments, um, they deal with our relationship with the Father, with, with God. The last six deal with our relationships with each other. And the first of those six, the fifth ten of the Ten Commandments, is this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. In other words, this is a command with promise. Give honor to your parents and you'll be a person whose life has a quality existence. Although the person who lives respectful of their parents has a much better chance for a long life, I also believe they'd have a very, very much a quality life. So it's fitting that we celebrate Mother's Day last month and Father's Day today. Now the reason God includes this in his commands is that, I think you would attest to this, it runs against our human nature. Our tendency is to fight and argue with authority, whether it be the authority of God or the authority of our parents. We want to be free. We want to do our own thing. We want to do it when we want to do it. We want to do it why we, because we want to do it. We don't want to do it based on what somebody else tells us to do. Now, I read another thing pertaining to this, to Father's Day, and it was simply titled Father. Here's what it said. Four years old, my daddy can do anything. Seven years old, my dad knows a lot, a whole lot. Twelve years old, oh, well, naturally, father doesn't know it all. Fourteen years old, dad, he's hopelessly old-fashioned. Twenty-one years old, oh, that man is out of date. What did you expect? Twenty-five years old, well, he knows a little bit about it, but not much. Thirty years old, i got to find out what dad thinks about it. 35 years old. Let's get dad's opinion on this first. 50 years old. I wonder what dad would have thought about it. 60 years old. My dad knew literally everything. 65 years old. I wish I could talk it over with dad one more time. Now I share that because, well, it appears to me and I'm sure a lot of you are going to agree with it, that our society is searching for a model father. So I did some more research, and I came across a book about fathers that was titled Finding Our Fathers, The Unfinished Business of Manhood. It was written by a Harvard University psychologist named Samuel Osherson, and he wrote this in 1986. Now in this book, he takes his own troubled relationship with his father as the springboard to his search for the meaning of fatherhood. He based it on his own autobiographical exploration and his clinical experience, as well as the study of 370 Harvard graduates over a 20-year period. He concludes that if you don't come to terms, terms with past relationships, especially with your parents, you will be condemned to repeat them. In other words, we will become, in essence, that very thing, those very parents that we swore we would never be. He goes on then to describe, well, a remote sadness, if you will, in his relationship with his own father and broadens that to conclude that very few men report a close and secure relationship with their own fathers. Most men feel that their fathers lack the emotional strength to tolerate openness with their sons. It's this lie that a man's world includes only a world of work, solitary pursuits, and of isolation. 
Now, as a researcher, this psychologist explained how males' early and ongoing relationship with their fathers shapes the intimacy and the work dilemmas men coming of age right now are still facing. As a therapist, he is impelled by a psychological urgency to heal the wounded father that men carry around inside themselves so that these men can become more loving and caring in relationships with their own children. Now, this was over 30 years ago. Okay, it's over that. It's 33 years ago. And it appears to me that this is not getting any better. In further research I did, I thought this would be interesting for you to hear. I want to share what I found out about what Ronald Reagan Jr. said about his dad. He stated that his dad, President Reagan, wasn't naturally equipped to be a very good father, but made up for it by being kind, understanding, and a good friend. He told how the president's father, Jr.'s grandfather, suffered from alcoholism and was often absent, providing no role model for his dad. Young Reagan then went on to note that as a result of his dad's own difficult background, the president was a person who was difficult to get to know well. So, I share all that because I find many today wondering, is there actually a role model for a good father? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. No, because there is no such thing as a perfect human father. Some I'll grant you do it better than others, and as a result, this may come easier for them, but none of us is perfect. I think about myself, and I, I sure thought I tried hard to be a good father, but I failed so many times while my kids were growing up. But I'm not giving up, and I don't want you to give up either. As a Christian, I know I can't do it perfectly, but as a Christian, I'm aware that somebody already did, and that is God. He's the perfect father. One day, Jesus, while he's walking with, with the gang, he told him this story that is probably the most appreciated story in the Bible, if not the most, one of the most. It's, come, it's become very popular to us as the parable of the prodigal son. It's recorded in Luke chapter 15. Now, I have on occasions used this parable as a preaching text, coming at it from different perspectives. I, I've talked about the prodigal son, noting the tendency in some of us to rebel and run away from God's love. Go into a far country, wasting the tremendous inheritance the Lord has given us, in disregard of the price <laughs> we are paying, and the heart of God, which is breaking on our behalf for our terrible decisions. This story, viewed from that perspective, tells us how we can come back to the Lord, our resources exhausted, and finding Him with open arms ready to embrace us. In other words, it's never too late to come back to the Lord. Ever. No matter what you think you've done, it's never too late. Now, I've also preached from this text from the perspective of the elder brother, referring to this as Christ's message to those stubborn, prideful, and critical saints. Jesus shares how easy we can slide into being just like this cold, calculating, worth ethic, self-righteous character who did things the way they were supposed to be done, scornful of his younger brother's recklessness, living with a uh, good riddance to bad rubbish type of attitude. How stunned he was when the younger brother, that prodigal, returned home only to get a banquet thrown in his honor. In other words, how resentful you and I can be when we've tried to do everything right and then we discover that God embraces even deathbed conversions, these people who have wasted their lives. The elder brother scenario helps us put a mirror up to us showing us how, you know, maybe our motivation for good work wasn't out of love for God and desire to be in relationship with God, but rather out of pride. Arrogance and self-protection. I've also given sermons about this parable from the perspective of the waiting father. He stands as a represent, representative of, of God. I, I tried to probe into the, you know, this divine human interaction of the way in which God deals with you and I. 
in our wild act of rebellion and on our cold, cynical, calculated self-righteousness. Talking about both of these brothers. God has a word for both the prodigal and the elder brother. It's an important word in which he calls both back to ourselves and what is to be in a relationship with him. However, leading up to this week, leading up to this day, I have come to this parable from a totally and entirely different perspective. I've been looking all over the place for something more than a theory about what is to be a model father. I've been praying a lot, like, God, I need to do something fresh. Suddenly, it dawned on me that it's possible to revisit this parable with a fresh lens. See, here we have a father of whom Jesus tells this story, interacting with his sons in a way which gives insight to you and me on how to be a model father, and in a broader sense, model parents. So ladies, mothers, this is for you as well. There's a few things I want to point out that I, I think we need to hear from this. First off, it's clear to me that a model father teaches the truth to his kids from the moment they're born. Jesus did not tell this story in a vacuum, folks. He's telling it to the Jewish people, Jews who knew the Old Testament scriptures, men and women who are familiar with the Mosaic law. Basic to this great heritage is this parental responsibility to expose one's children to the teachings of the scriptures, both in thought and in action. Just before entering the promised land, Moses reminds the people of Israel, and he's reminding them of something that they had heard before. And remember, Moses doesn't even get to go into the promised land, but he's again being a very good father figure in instructing them on what God told them. So here we go, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And furthermore, essential to this teaching is discipline. Moses incorporates these words into his address to these people just a few chapters later. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 5, the Bible says, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So there's, there's a warning, if you will, here, not only to fathers, but to mothers as well, to live under the authority of God's teachings. So as we live under God's authority, what we teach our children about the ways of God should take on a little bit more relevance. See, if we teach our children one mode of conduct and then live under a different mode ourselves, the kids are going to smell that out, and you're, you're just showing hypocrisy left and right, and they know it, right? We, parents, we, fathers, we must live under the teaching and the discipline of God, even as we endeavor to faithfully teach and discipline our own children. The next thing I see in this parable of the prodigal is that the model father has respect for individual autonomy. Now, let me dig into this a little bit. What would your reaction be if one of your children came to you, thumbing his nose at you, demanding that you give him total freedom and his fear of the finances for his rebellion? That's a tough one, isn't it? It was not unusual, folks, for a Jewish father to distribute his estate before he died if he wanted to retire early. Uh, right? If he wanted his sons then to take over the actual management of the business. Under, under the Jewish law, there are clear delineation of the father's financial responsibilities to his sons if he's retiring. The older son would get two-thirds and the younger son would get one-third. But in this famous story Jesus is sharing, there is a certain demanding attitude, if you will, from this younger son. He's saying, Dad, life is too short for me to wait for you to die or for you to retire. <laughs> 
I'm going to get it anyway. So give it to me now. I'm bored. I'm hemmed in. I want out. Now, the, now listen, listen. The father could have said no. Okay? He could have tried to blackmail him, telling him, Hey, son, if you stick here, it's going to be better for you because there's even going to be more coming in. So if you hang out, you'll get more. Does that make sense? You, you, some, of the, some of us maybe hear those things in our lives. We could have played, you know, the dad could have played the comparison game. He could have said, hey, why aren't you a good son like the older brother? What are you trying to do, break your mother's heart? You know those little games we play, those manipulation games. No, fa folks, this father was prepared to stand by the teachings and the humbly modelings that he and his wife had shared from infancy with these boys. This father was willing to evaluate each one of them for who they were as individuals. He knows their strengths and weaknesses. Do you not know yours? I'm sure you do. He was prepared to let this young man be an adult. He knew that God and his creative design had not made human people robots, automatons, who function as mechanical men and women. To be a created human was to have freedom to obey as well as to disobey. The model father has respect for the individual autonomy of each of their children. So, without preaching a doomsday sermon, he divided his estate. He gave his son what he asked for, and he bid him farewell, which leads to the next thing I kind of need to point out that I notice about this dad, and that is the model father won't stand in the way of consequences. Apparently, this father had money and he had servants. See, what I'm getting at is he could have played a manipulative game here. He could have assigned one of his servants to shadow this rebellious son, right? Carrying various disguises with him, right? And staying a distance, going wherever this son went, making certain he had no idea that he'd been being followed, keeping an eye on him, and then reporting back to, his, to the father what was going on, right? letting him know the things he's doing and the people he's meeting, right? So that he wouldn't squander the fortune thinking, I'm, I'm sure, that, like a dad could do this. I've worked hard for all this, and no son of mine is going to waste it. Hello. Good morning. Right? He could have had a little, like, little anonymous reminders put in the way if it was like the son was going to get in trouble. Like, this guy could have then come in and go, hey, 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 your father wouldn't like this, would he? If things got really bad, he could have had him brought home thinking, hey, <laughs> his mother and I could never live with ourselves if we knew our son was hanging out with prostitutes or becoming an alcoholic or catching a venereal disease or marrying outside of our faith. At the first sign of homelessness or homesickness, like this spy servant could have jumped in there, right? And could have reminded him, hey, hey, I know you're hungry right now. Remember your mom's hot chicken soup? Remember that nice bed and that nice warm shower you had back at home? But none of that happened, folks. The point is, the model father will not stand in the way of consequences of his kids when they come of age. He's not in the business of premature rescue, in other words. And neither does God. That's the point. As much as his heart is probably breaking, and he knows that there's trouble ahead... He releases them and lets go. So I ask you and I ask myself, is this the kind of father, is this the kind of mother we are? Are we faithfully willing to teach and model? Do we respect the autonomy of our kids when they come of age? Are we willing to let them walk away from us no longer nurtured and controlled by us, but free to live in a tough, hard world unprotected? The reality is, we don't have much choice. Listen, if you don't let them go, they're going to rebel anyway, aren't they? Is anyone hearing this? The longer you try to control them and manipulate them, the worse it's going to be when they walk away. <coughs> let them walk away under their choice. Listen, how much better to take the initiative and to say, Son, this is your life. I've done the best I can. It hasn't been that good at some points. 
You know my weaknesses, and I've made, them, I've made enough mistakes. Forgive me for them. It's your life. You know that I, what, I, what I believe in, and I hope I've shown you that. I'm willing to cut the strings of control. You are free to be who you choose to be, to do what you choose to do, and to live with those consequences. I hope you know I love you. I always will. I may not always have handled you correctly, and I will make mistakes in the future, but you know what? I'm always going to be your father. And with a big hug and probably some tears, we are prepared to send them off to seek their own fortune, to face whatever may be the consequences, positive, negative, or anywhere in between. Now another thing reading this story, again, shows me is that the model father has a love that refuses to give up. What I'm getting at is, most of us have a breaking point. We, we can put up with just so much nonsense. We're patient up to a point. We, we have hope up to a point. We are willing to be tolerant up to a point. The fact is that our children have the God-given freedom to go their own ways and never come back, if they so choose. We cannot force them to honor us. And at the very same time, God pity the son or daughter who has a parent who has given up on them. Very few experiences could be more devastating to be disowned by one's parents. We are called parents to be faithful, to show faithfulness. The same faithfulness that is modeled by the father in this story. Just imagine how this whole story, how the plot would change if the father took this kind of attitude. Okay, this is the way my son wants to have it? I'll go along with it, but I think it's dumb. He's making a terrible mistake. He's entitled to do it, that's fine. But he better not ever come back here again. I'm done with that ungrateful kid. And I know there's some of you looking at me right now who have had that said to you. Instead, we see this father faithfully carrying out his ongoing responsibilities. He's not chasing after the prodigal, but he's daily aware of his own breaking heart. In other words, it's something I don't think people realize. I think it's important for us to learn how to live with a broken heart as a parent. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Take courage. I have overcome the world. This is like this realistic candor. I mean, it's just so candid. It's right in our face. In the teachings. We are alerted to the reality of life. None of us is free from trouble. We are called to continue doing what God has called us to do, while at the very same time, we're privileged to scan the horizon, just hoping for the reunion with that son. Here's the other thing. We may have caused some of the rebellion. And if so, dads, we need to own that. What I'm getting at is perhaps a phone call or a letter or a text or an email to that child. Yes, they're adult now, but you've got to say something like, hey, I'm sorry. Forgive me for what I said. I love you. I want a restored relationship with you. What I'm talking about is the adult, the parent, taking an initiative that frees the younger person to accept it or to not accept it, to obey or not obey. You've got to go lower, parents. You've got to go lower, Dad. It's just a matter of going on and fulfilling the responsibility which you assumed as a parent. <laughs> Somehow, I'm never able to rid myself of the picture of the father who, as he's working in the field, was constantly scanning the horizon. Jesus alerts us to this fact. He tells us, but while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. In other words, this father's love was a love that refused to give up. Bottom line is the model father is forgiving. What would your reaction be if your child did to you what the prodigal did to his father? I have a sneaking suspicion that many of us would be tempted to give them the I told you so speech.
And we'd probably be prepared to deliver this at a moment's notice. We got that bad boy right in the back pocket, ready to go. Keeping it in the wallet for that moment. The father in Jesus' story here, this model father, avoids a vindictive attitude. Instead, love just explodes within him. He has compassion. He runs. He embraces this son. He kisses him. The son has prepared a speech, right? And he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father doesn't linger even a second over the son's acknowledged sinfulness and unworthiness. He is not interested in saying, I told you so. Instead, he's overwhelmed with joy that floods his body. He can do nothing but rejoice. The model father, then, is a great example that dads, we need to be kind of a celebratory person. He doesn't even give his son a chance to ask for a serve, to be a servant, right? He calls, he tells the, the father tells the servants, he says, bring his robe. Now, in the Hebrew tradition, the robe stands for honor. He says, bring the ring, right? The ring stands for authority. In that culture, the signet ring, if you gave it to somebody, it was like you gave them the power of attorney for you. All right? He says, bring the shoes. Now, the shoes is significant because if you had a shoe that, that you were given, it meant you were a son. Slaves didn't always have shoes. Okay? Shoes were a sign of freedom. Then dad doesn't quit there. You know what he does next? He calls for a banquet, a feast to make merry. He says, for this son, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So, so, as I evaluate myself, I realize I need a lot of work. I got to work more at this, even though my kids are grown up. I'm not certain that I could have been quite as spontaneous and exuberant as this model father. Huh. I, I think I would have had to wait to have the party. I might have done some of the other things, but I don't think I could have had the party right away. I mean, here's the deal. I mean, I would have wanted to know whether or not he had really come clean or if he's going to turn right around and do the same thing again. So I think I would have put the party off for a few days or weeks maybe, right? I'd want to see if, you know, if how he's doing the job. I'd try to measure how, you know, if he's doing a good job. I, after all, I don't, I'd probably go, uh, it's not fair to the other kids, okay? In this case, the older brother, who, who's been faithful and stayed here, right? To have this kind of big extravaganza. I guess what I'm saying <laughs> is that I don't like some of the things I see in myself when I compare myself to this model father. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying this, I have much to learn, I have more to grow. I have more to transform, Right? as I take a close look at this biblical example. And this is the example to model. All right? And finally, the last thing I see in this model father is the willingness to live with ambiguity. See, we don't know the end of the story. We do know that the older son got angry, was ticked off. And the father had to live with that anger. The other son viewed this as extremely unfair. He wasn't the least bit interested in being part of the celebration. And Jesus has a very interesting way of bringing this story to a conclusion. I mean, I, I encourage you all, if you haven't read this recently, to go read this. It's in chapter 15 of Luke. It's a wonderful story. But in, it ends with the father's response to the elder brother's sneering accusation that there had never been a party for him. The older brother is furious that this no-good brother who devoured the father's hard-earned money with harlots ends up getting the fatted calf killed in his honor. And what's dad's response? He acknowledges the faithfulness of the older brother, yet dad makes no demands for performance on the younger brother. I, I read that as life goes on. I'm going to ask the band to return to the stage. What I'm getting at, in other words, is Jesus shares this, and I think there's a reason. None of us knows the future, do we? Being a father, being a mother has no sealed and signed guarantees, folks. We are called to live with the ambiguity which is built into relationships. In other words, the model father accepts this as a fact of life and moves on. 
faithfully doing and being what God has called him to be, no matter what the significant others in his life choose to do and choose to be. See, our final reward, folks, isn't the privilege of sitting back and saying, hey, you know, I, I guess I was a pretty good dad. The kids are alive. They're married. They're off. You know, they, you know. Uh, and, and listen, I'm not saying there, there will be joys when you get together. There should be joys when you get together. This hoped-for relationship with your grown children. But the final reward will be when the real model father, God himself, looks us in the eye and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't ever forget that the model that you're looking for is God. You're not going to find it here. It doesn't exist here. It only exists in God. And if you're emulating God here, then you're emulating the model father. Because we're not God. The key... <coughs> The key is willingness to say, dads, I'm sorry when you're wrong. The key is saying, I forgive you when they're wrong. The key is that you're willing to stand by your children whenever they come back when they've been wrong. Now, I hope this inspires the dads in the room. I hope it encourages them to grasp the reality that it's not easy. It's very hard. And, and you need to hang around other men maybe to help you. And if, and if you didn't have a, a father that you can talk to, there are some guys around here that you can talk to to help you and guide you. So I want to encourage you to get over maybe some of your issues about admitting you've made mistakes because join the club. We've all made them. If you're here today and you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's very easy. It's, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and Savior. We partake in communion here every service. It's in the back. You, you do this as a sign of worship for Him. You partake in the elements as a worshiping of our Lord and Savior, not just the playing, but the worship that way. The altar team will be up here, available for you if you have any prayer requests. Please don't leave today, dads, without knowing that the ultimate father cares for you more than you can possibly imagine, regardless of how many mistakes you've made as a father yourself. He's willing and able and wanting to forgive you if you come and confess. He will help you and guide you and minister to you on how to con step forward in your next endeavor as a dad. So I ask you to come to your feet as we continue praising and, our, and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>